Welcome back to our study uh, on the book of Romans. This is Sonship Establishment Part 3, and this is Session 28. We looked at, uh, I was telling you right at the break, I know we kind of got off, I, I started to tell you at the break that the things that you were going to learn in the curriculum that cause you to overcome all those seven categories of will not just be to God's glory while it is on this earth, as wonderful as that is, but Excuse me, I want to skip over to 1 Timothy, to the pastoral epistles. Now look, I know, you say, well, you're jumping us way over, and I get that. But you understand, the pastoral epistles are not, well, I'm going to get myself in a hole here. That's not where you're actually going to learn the curriculum as a son. Those are instructions to a pastor that actually talks about functioning as a father to an assembly. But... I just want to show you, because he's reminding Timothy of something here in 1 Timothy 4, 8. For bodily exercise profiteth little. And let me just say something about that. He's not talking about working out at the gym. You know, I've heard guys quote that verse, you know. They say, well, the Bible says that bodily exercise profits a little. Okay, that's not what that, it, bo the bodily exercise talking about here is talking about the religious practices that you do. When you kneel or you make the sign of the cross or you do all of that, that, you know, that may make you feel better, but that's not accomplishing godliness. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the, ec the bodily exercise of religious components, okay? For bodily exercise, profit a little. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't get away from that. Gold's gym, okay. But godliness, see, but is a corner word. It's going in a whole different direction. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. And so you see that all of this, learning to think, live, and labor like your father, is not only going to profit you now, it is going to profit you in that which is to come. And so that's the point that I wanted to make about that before we started kind of moving ourselves on. Now, <clears throat> I did want to say one word about this. And this is another one of those things that I know deserves more attention. So at some point, maybe we ought to produce something just on the side about this. But you may be saying to yourself, how in the world does that, how is, that, how is going through those kinds of things going to profit us at all when we get out into the creature? Well, there's a couple of ways that you can answer that question. And let, so let me just do it briefly. Number one, what those produce in conforming you to the image of Christ is one thing that the going, enduring all those tribulations will benefit you out in the creature. You, you, you understand, they're working to conform you to the image of God's Son. That's going to benefit you out there. So even though they were bad things here, they will work for your good later. But there's another way. In fact, there's several more ways in which those work. Because you're going to be dealing, I, again, I hate to just jump you over, but just to kind of address this issue. Remember the very familiar passage in Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against principalities and powers. Uh, I'm sorry, against flesh and blood, but against, <laughs> but, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual weakness in high places. The, you really are going to be impacting Satan's realm and you are going to be conducting a spiritual warfare against principalities and powers. Now, it's interesting that it doesn't just say Satan, but you're actually going to be engaged against his minions as you're making an impact in his realm. The point that I want to make with that is, as you do that, and as those tribulations of all those various kinds come against you as you advance as a son, Bless you. You're going to learn the particular way in which angels think. And since you're going to be judging angels in eternity, and you need to understand that angels do not think about things the way you do. I mean, not completely. I mean, we often ask the question, if Satan is a created being, and he knows God is God, and he knows what God has the ability to do. And he obviously is familiar with the Scripture, is he not? And you, you, you know, in fact, Satan probably knows more about the Scripture than most safe folks know about the Scripture. 
And because of that, you know that the Bible actually talks about things that He will do and, and what God will do in response to that. It almost begs the question, doesn't it? If you're Him, why do that? Or if you've already read about how that's going to do, why not do something different? He doesn't think about that the way you think about that. It's a different kind of thinking. And you're going to, as you go through those issues, the ones that are behind those issues, you're going to get, you're going to be, remember we, when we talked about, you don't just get those four decision-making skills, but now you hone those skills and you're able to see below the surface to what's working behind the scenes you're going to begin to get insight now into how angels think. And just because they're a bad angel doesn't mean they don't think like an angel. It just means they're thinking like a bad angel. You're going to judge angels. You're going to administrate over them. And you're going to have to understand, if you're going to communicate with them about the things that you want them to do, you're going to have to understand how angels think. Now, Billy was saying to me the other day, she said, well, I'll be glad when we get up in the creature and I get my glorified body and I won't have to carry this purse around everywhere. And I said, well, you can just get an angel to carry it for you. And she said, yeah, but why would I need it? I'm not going to need a lipstick. I got glorified lips. She said, I'm not, what else? There's a bunch of stuff in there. She's got some bare aspirin in there. She said, I'm not going to need that. Not going to need my wallet. <laughs> okay, Dorothy. <laughs> Are we going to be boys and girls? Are, okay. We're getting into well, okay. <laughs> you, oh, no, 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 no. Very clever. Very clever. How about them cowboys? How about them cowboys? <laughs> All right, I'm going to reserve my comments on both of those for now. But those are good questions, though. Oh, by, by the way, by the way, I, I, I'll just say this very quickly. I need to put together a series of, of tapes that answer commonly asked questions. So starting now, I mean, from now on, if you'll bring written down, if you think of something, here's a question I used to have, and I think a lot of people would have it. If you'll bring those to me, I'm going to start producing discs that will answer those common questions so that we can, I just answer them. I'm just going to do short answers. I'm going to do a 10-part study on it. I'm just going to give a, you know, a 5, 10-minute answer and try to answer a bunch of them. So if you can help me out with that, that'd be, that'd be great. Okay. Yes? This is godly wisdom. Godly, this is what we're being taught through, through sonship. That's correct. Okay, so do angels think like God? Or do they no. Uh, no, they don't think like no, God. No, they're not do thinking they like God. Better than we do as a human being without sonship? Only sometimes. Only sometimes. Mm -hmm. Only sometimes. So they if you say, well, give me an example of those who did not. Uh, they followed Lucifer. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah. That's a pretty bad decision, right? No, no, no. Okay, I'm just saying. Kind of the ultimately bad decision. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, when God created hell, the rest of them went like, no, I never was thinking about that. No, no, no. Okay, Psalm 44. Let me get you over there. Because this is what Paul referenced there when he said, as it is written, we are killed all the day long. We are counted sheep for the slaughter. And so let's take a look at Psalm 44. And we're going to read these first eight verses. To the chief musician for the sons of Korah masculine. Now that's the superscription. And any time you see a psalm with maskil in it here's what you know you know it is a psalm of instruction for someone and you know that it is prophetic now what you have to do then is you have to look at the psalm and you have to decide who that is to prophetically now remember this is being written you know back during the interlude of mercy between the first and the second courses of punishment right Okay, well, you know now. It was being written when God, remember they'd gone through the 450 years of the judges and they were ready to receive the second course of punishment. But then God, <coughs> in, a, in an act of mercy, rolled back the judgments 
and honored the reign of David and Solomon. And under David, they overcame all of their enemies. And under Solomon, they not only were at peace, but they had the greatest land area the, the kingdom of Israel had ever uh, uh, occupied. And it was so great, in fact, things were so good in the nation that word got to the queen of Sheba about how wonderful it was. She didn't believe it. She came to see for herself, and when she got there, there's a statement that's recorded that she made over in the Old Testament where she said, you know, I heard about this and how wonderful it would be, and I didn't think it could be like that. And she said, but truly the half was not told unto me. And that's where that old hymn came from, the half has ne'er been told. That, that's where that, that came out of that old time. Well, that's, how, God, that's what God intended for them. He intended to so bless them. In fact, the prophets recorded it like this, that the people of the world would look at the nation of Israel and say, there is no nation on the earth like that nation, and there's no God like their God. And that would cause them to submit themselves to the nation of Israel and to Israel's God. And they would become the head of all nations. And God would reconcile the world back to Himself through the instrumentality of Israel. That's when, And He was showing them, this is how I want this to work. And during that interlude, when the, when the judgments are rolled back, He establishes the Davidic covenant. And if you understand the import of that covenant... And the time during those 80 years when, when there was great prosperity in the land. <coughs> if you, when you see all of that, you recognize this is God giving them a picture of what He wants to do. But believe me, the picture that Israel had was only a small portion of what it's really going to be like. Because as much as it impacted the world then, when that kingdom cranks up, for real, the whole world is going to stand in awe of that. Now, I, this, so this, this mass kill psalm is meant to be instruction, a prophetic instruction for someone. There's something sitting in this psalm that tells us what course of punishment is involved in this, in Israel's history, and we'll see that when we get there. But let's start out and take a look at how this psalm begins. We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days in times of old. And they're saying, we, we, we've heard, told how you did some things. And so now we'll look at the next verse too. How thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantest them. How thou didst afflict the people and cast them out. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them. But thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst a favor unto them. You know what they're doing here is they're saying, <clears throat> we know that when we came into the land, how we got that land. That wasn't by our sword or our strength. God, you're the one that did that. And they're saying, we've heard all of that. Now what they're about to do now is start to make a complaint. Because they're saying, we've heard about these wonderful things that you've done. Now, we're going to pick this up in verse 9. Because all they're really doing now from verses 4 through 8 is reviewing what happened when God cast out the heathen and did all those things. Now in verse 9 they say, But thou hast cast off and put us to shame. So let me just make a note of something here and show you this. Thou hast cast off and put us to shame. Now I'm not going to put the whole thing up here. It's not necessary because I'm going somewhere with this. And goest not forth with our armies. Thou makest us to turn back from the enemy. And they which hate us spoil for themselves. Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat. And hast scattered us among the heathen. What is sheep appointed for meat? What does that mean? Yeah, that, exactly. Now, it says, and hast, look at this last phrase scattered us among the heathen. You automatically know what, what course of punishment that is. That's the fifth course of punishment, isn't it? Now what you've got to determine is where in that fifth course of punishment are you talking about? Because that fifth course of punishment has five parts to it. You have the 70-year captivity in which they were scattered among the heathen in Babylon. But then, remember, you have 
you have that seven weeks, remember? And, and, and we have the 70 years, and then you have the seven weeks, and that's the 49 years of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, remember, under the Medes and the Persians. And then you have that 400 years where God is going to go silent to the nation. There's going to be a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. And then you've got that 34 years that runs from the time John the Baptist is born until Jesus' ministry is over on the cross. <coughs> and that's, of course, when God begins speaking to the nation again. And, 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 and so the only thing you've got left now is, and of course there's an interruption of the dispensation of grace, and we do know that in the book of Luke that the Lord talked about a single year of extension of mercy to Israel, and that's recorded in Acts chapter 1 to verse 8. But as far as the prophecy goes, that's interrupted by the dispensation of grace. And when that's over, there's going to be that last seven-year period, that 70th week that Daniel talked about, in which th that's going to be the Lord's day of wrath. And, and they're going to find themselves scattered here, <clears throat> and they're going to find themselves scattered here. And so you're looking at one of those two, and I think there are some very instructive things in the psalm that locate for you exactly where, prophecy-wise, this is taking place. Well, let's just take a look at this. Now, in fact, back me up one, Trent, because I don't want us to lose. You've cast us off. you put us to shame. You, you make us to turn back from the enemy. You've given us like sheep appointed for meat. You've scattered us among the heathen. And now we'll look at the next verse, 12. Thou sellest thy people for naught, and dost not increase thy wealth by their price. Thou makest us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about us. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. My confusion, is, by the way, there's a change here. Back, back me up one frame. Look, it says, thou makest us, thou makest us. Uh, do you, thou sellest thy people. Do you, do, you, do you see it's us? It's a plural. Now look at the change here in this next verse. Now give me that next slide. My confusion is continually before me. Do you see the change now? He's not talking about the people now. Now you're coming back to the psalmist who says, My confusion is continually before me, and the shame of my face hath covered me. For the voice of him that reproacheth and blasphemeth by reason of the enemy and the avenger. Now, <clears throat> we've read these two, but where I'm really trying to get us to now is I want you to see this thing that I alluded to up here just real quickly in Leviticus 26. Look in verse 27. This is the start of the fifth course of punishment in the book of Leviticus. And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I will chasten you seven times for your sins, and I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. Now, look what he says. I'll bring the land into desolation. Look at verse 33. And I will scatter you among the heathen. Isn't that the exact terminology that we just read over there in Psalm 44? It is. And he says, And I'll draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. So I'm just showing you that's how you get to the fifth course of punishment because that's the very terminology in which that's used, okay? Now, give me this next one. Now, I think we're back to Psalm 44. I've already talked to you about that superscription, and that's what I wanted to do right there. There's actually some other things that are in. This is, this is a, a part of a grouping of psalms. Um, <clears throat> you, the, five, there are, the, the psalms are divided into five books, and... Um, and those five books of the Psalms also correlate to the five mandates of the Davidic covenant. And that means that you have the Redeemer and His redemption. You have the Deliverer and His deliverance. You have the Avenger and His avenging. You have the King and His kingdom. And you have the Blesser and His blessing. And those are the five mandates of the Davidic covenant. And those all come... The Redeemer, you know, where that, that on the timeline, that happens at the cross. These two happen right over here at the, in the Lord's Day of Wrath. He delivers them through the tribulation, and then He avenges His cause with Israel at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ when He returns in flaming vengeance, okay? And then these two, so these two are happening out in the Day of Wrath, and these two 
are happening in the kingdom, with the setup of the kingdom. So those are all happening through a process of, of time in Israel's program. You understand that none of those are taking place in the present dispensation of Gentile grace. Okay, <clears throat> so these psalms, I believe, are actually prophetic to the believing remnant that are out here in the day of wrath. Now, I'm not saying that you can't make a case for them being scattered among the heathen when they went away into, into Babylon. You could, but it's not going to change what Psalm 44 is saying, and that's really what we're after because that's what Paul is after. He's not really trying to do anything except take something out of Psalm 44 and make a comparison issue as it is written. He's going to make a comparison issue out of it, and I want to show you uh, that comparison. But let me just show you, in Psalm, because of where it shows up in Psalm 44, you understand this first one. And I think, I, 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 might, I, I think this runs from Psalm 1 to 41. I used to have this written in my Bible, and I changed Bibles, and I don't... I never, but 41, and this one runs from 42 to 83. Does anybody have that written down or commit it to memory? No? Okay. Anyway, it doesn't matter. This is in the second book of the Psalms. And if that's about the deliverer, well then, there you are, the second mandate of the Davidic covenant. Okay? Anyway, <clears throat> just to make that point, let me take you back to Psalm 42 and just show you this one. To the chief musician, musician Maskill, so you know this is another prophetic, instructive psalm. And, of course, verse 1, you're familiar with that verse. I'm just trying to show you that Psalm 42, which is the first psalm in the second book of Psalms, starts with a Maskill uh, psalm, which gives you instruction. Now look at 43.1. I think that's the next thing I have up. I went to 44. Well, 43, let me just tell it to you. 43 has no superscription. What do you suppose that means? No prophetic instruction. Oh, close. Uh, that's, a, that's a good idea, but there's really something more there. If 42, if 42 has... Now, Tommy could be right, but listen... If you were going to have a psalm that was going to take you in a different direction, you would have a different superscription that would not be a masculine psalm. What, what did Trent say? Okay, well, what it is is it is a different psalm, but it is a continuation of the previous psalm. Does that make sense? So when you have no superscription, you're supposed to see that as this is like part two. Or part three. And, and then when he changes gears, he will put a different superscription up that lets you know this is how we're changing now. Now we're doing, now we're doing this. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Psalm, okay, give me that next one, 4417. All right, now we're back to Psalm 44, which, by the way, is another masculine psalm. Remember, 42 had the masculine, 43 did not, 44 does. All this has come upon us. I want you to remember, remember what they just got through saying. You have cast us off. You, we've turned our back to the enemies. You know, all these, you know, we're scattered. Okay, all this has come upon us. Yet, have we not forgotten thee? Neither have we dealt falsely in thy covenant. Our heart is not turned back. Neither have our steps declined from thy way. Now, let me ask you, do you think this is talking about the believing remnant or the apostate nation? This is the believing remnant, isn't it? Sure. Though thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death, if we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a strange God, shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. You know what they're saying is, we're not just talking like we're doing the right thing. You know we're doing the right thing. But remember how verse 9, back, back me up, Trent, just another and another, one more. There. Look, just look. You've cast us off and put us to shame, made us turn our back to our enemy. They spoil us. The, we're like sheep for meat. You scatter us among the heathen, that next front. You sell us for naught. You make us a reproach. We're a byword. 
among the heathen. And, and then, all right, now catch me, uh, catch me back up to where we just left off. One, one, oh yeah, all, that's it, that's it. All this has come upon us. Yet, they're saying, we have not forgotten thee. Even though these things are happening, we, we know who we're serving. And I really like the fact they say, neither have our steps declined from thy way. We're doing what we're supposed to do. Do you see that? And then in verse and, and 19, it says, Though you have broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death. And then they're saying, we haven't forgotten the name of our God. We haven't stretched out our hand to a false God. If we had, you would know that. All right, now give me that next. Now, now look at verse 22, because here's what follows. Yea, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to say about this passage. <coughs> and that is, this is a continuation of the complaint. This is almost like a conclusive statement. In fact, they've already kind of alluded to this once. Remember what they said? We're like sheep appointed to meat. Do you remember that? Now they're making a statement that says, Yea, for thy sake we are killed. Now, let me ask you a question. Does the believing remnant know who they're serving? Well, of course they do. Of course they do. Do, do they realize that the things that are happening to them are happening to them because of who they are? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and when that's happening, it says, for thy sake, now we're not going to do it today, but the next time, because I've got to get somewhere with this today, when we come back, I want to talk about that word sake, because I think there's a little confusion about that word. That word, <clears throat> that is a word that is used in more than one way, and those ways are different. Listen to me carefully. And if they're different, you can't use it both ways. Are you with me there? You can only use it one way. So here's what I'm saying. Pick one. You, 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 you can't stretch that. If, if a word has two different meanings, you have to figure out which one it means. Yes? I don't think I'm being unfair about that. So, yea, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Look at verse 23. Because, and again, we'll enlarge on this later, but 22, folks, is a complaint. In other words, it's kind of the conclusion you come to after saying, you've cast us off, you've put us to shame, you made us turn our back to our enemies, you've sold us out to them, they're doing whatever they want to with us. Yay! You know what the word yay is? It is a word of emphasis. It's like using the word verily. When Jesus used the word verily, he was saying truly. He was calling attention to what he's going to say. They're calling attention. For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, <clears throat> listen carefully. That is not an epiphany of them coming to a conclusion about what they now understand. That is a complaint. How do you know that? Because look at verse 23. Awake! Why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise! Cast us not off forever. How did their complaint start in verse 9? You've cast us off and put us to shame. What are they saying in verse 23? Arise, Lord, cast us not off forever. Does that look any different to you than verse 9? Well, it doesn't to me. They use the exact same terminology. Cast us not off forever. Look at 24. Wherefore hidest thou thy face? What is that accusing God of doing? Wherefore hidest thou thy face, and forgettest our affliction and our oppression? 
Is this a psalm of complaint? Yes or no? Yes. Verse 25, for our soul is bowed down to the dust and our belly cleaveth unto the earth. Arise for our help and redeem us for thy mercy's sake. Now I have a conundrum for you to figure out. Are you ready for your homework? I give it to you early. <laughs> what did Trent say? Never mind, I don't want to know. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to cut it short. If I'm right, and I think I am, and everybody that I know that teaches sonship agrees with this, that doesn't make it right, I'm just saying there's comfort with the crowd. If I'm right, and these things are progressive, in other words, Satan can't just throw the kitchen sink at you right off the bat. If that's true, and these people are being killed and counted as sheep for the slaughter, do you think that's just des describing a little anxiety? Their life is on the line, is it not? That would tell you they are what kind of son? Fully educated son. Now here's the question I have for you then, and you don't have to, don't answer it today. I want you to work on this. If they are fully educated sons, why in the world are they asking God to get up and intervene in their physical circumstances? Let me ask you this. Don't, are you a fully educated son yet? No. no. Are we even simple sons yet? No. Do you not already know better than that? You're telling me a fully educated son is saying, where are you, God? You must be sleeping, verse 23. You're oblivious to what we're going through. Does that sound like the statement a fully educated son is going to make? In the Israel pro it is in the Israel program. So a fully educated son in the Israel program doesn't know. That's, that's an answer. That's an answer. Jesus well, Israel, got to the point where, that where the educated asked, son come from? Jesus got to the point that he asked, let the cup pass. Are they let not under knew, tutors and governors? Let, uh, and let children? your will take place. Are the, is the believing remnant being treated as sons in the day of wrath? They should be. That's right. This is the day of wrath. Ah, remember? They are a kind of first fruits of his creature. And as a testimony and witness to the rest of the nation, God is dealing with them as sons. Now, let's suppose for the sake of argument that Linda is right. You were saying the same thing, weren't you, Dorothy? Okay, so Dorothy is right too. Okay, so I'm just going to let them say we're both going to get right. Okay, okay. Now let's suppose that that she's right. That as a fully educated son, whose life is on there is another answer to this, but let's go with this for now. As a fully educated son, you're wondering what is going on. Why doesn't God get up and do something here? Because hey, we're just being staked out like sheep. Here's my point then, and that really makes my point. Isn't verse 22 a continuation of the complaint? Now, I'm going to ask you, in the dispensation of grace, is that the thinking you are supposed to have as a son? Beautiful. I almost just want to just say how good that is. I mean, I just did say it. <laughs> What's the next verse? I kind of lost track on the notes. What's the next verse? Yeah, I was showing about how their lives are on the line. Remember? They're, when they're hot, remember when they flee to the mountains? Look, Lamentations, find it. We get our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. As they go out to gather manna out there in the day of wrath, they're going to be doing that 
in the peril of their own lives. I mean, they could actually lose their life just trying to get something to eat out there, right? That's the things that are happening out in, in the day of wrath. Now, <coughs> I wanted to talk about that we in Psalm 44, but before I do that, uh, no, no, let's, let's go to, um, no, I don't want to do that. Here's what I want to do. Yes, this is what I want to do. I don't have Romans 8 back up there yet, do I? Look, look and see if I do. If you don't, just turn to it. Just turn to Romans 8 because that's what I want right there. By the way, when Paul quotes that, does anybody see a word missing out of that? He quotes Psalm 44, 22. As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day and counted as sheep for the slaughter. What word is missing? Yay. Yea is the word that calls attention to the plight. Remember, it's like saying, truly, we are killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Paul leaves that word out. And he just quotes the meat of the complaint. What does that follow on the heels of? The seven categories of suffering, right? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution all the way down to sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Here's my point. That is not a remedy. That is part of the complaint. That's how you feel when you come down to here. You start feeling like I'm being killed all the day long. Now, we'll talk about what that phrase means maybe next time, or, or counted as sheep for the slaughter, but I think you get the general idea of that. Won't you, if you're going through this, don't you kind of feel like, man, I feel like the goat in the Jurassic Park movie that was staked out waiting for the T-Rex to come by. What is the next word that Paul, after he writes this in verse 37, what is the next word Paul gives you in verse 37? Nay. Nay, which is no. Now, it's more than no, and that's why it's nay. Does the Bible use no? It does, lots of times. But it also, by the way, it doesn't use nay near as many times as it uses the word no. In fact, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll do some work on that when we talk about what the word nay. Nay is actually from two of the old English words that have a, a specific meaning behind them that no doesn't have, and we'll talk about that. But here's what, here's what this is boiling down to, and this is what I want to end with right here. There are some things that are going to be done that are going to try to make you throw in the towel on your sonship life. It's going to start off with some mental tribulations, and it may end up... <coughs> with successfully taking your life because you're going to go through all kinds of different perils. There'll be things in between in which you may be uh, hungry and you may be naked and you may be persecuted and your life will be in danger on many different occasions and it may even successfully take your life. And before that happens, when these things are coming on you, you may feel like just like the believing remnant as the believing remnant thought, we are killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And Paul is going to say to you that just like their thinking wasn't right, neither is that thinking for you because the next word out of his mouth is nay. In all these things, what are these things? Not just these things. Back, back, back me up one. No, sorry. There. We're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. I don't, it doesn't matter what makes you think that. In all these things, now give me that verse, Trent. We are more than conquerors. You tell me, is it a different mindset to go through that as more than a conqueror or to go through that as sheep for the slaughter? Is that different? Yes, yes that's different. That's not, verse 36 isn't part of the remedy it's part of the problem. It's part of, it's part of the wrong thinking. It's part of this. 
<laughs> nothing's going right for me. Everything's going wrong. Everything's going sour. I'm just nothing more than a sheep for the slaughter. That's what they thought. That's why they were telling God, rise up. Why are you sleeping? You're supposed to come and help us. You are supposed to know better than that. You already know better than that. You, as an educated son, would never look back at the things that are happening to you. Do you think Paul ever looked back and went, Oh, God, I don't understand why they're pursuing me from city to city. This just isn't fair. He not only knew what was happening, he knew why it was happening. And he knew what his response to that was going to be. Yes? And because of that, he was able to respond to that to the glory of his Father. Not going around wondering, well, God, you must be sleeping. You must be indifferent to what's going on with us. You must not care. You, 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 you're oblivious to our distresses and our persecutions. Don't you care? That's not the talk of an educated son. You know what? That's the talk of a son that isn't even a simple son. That, that's, that's, not, that's not what that is. In this dispensation of grace, you know exactly what the policy of evil is trying to do with that, and you know exactly why your father's allowing that to happen, and you know that those things are working together for good. And you know that. And you understand what kind of good that is. And you also understand that there's a doctrine that allows you to endure all of those things to His glory and to your benefit. And as you go through them, and then when you're going through them, you're not looking at them like, man, I'm just a little sheep waiting to get my head chopped off. You're going through it as more than a conqueror. Amen. And that's a huge difference in thinking. And that's why Paul said, and the only reason I bring this up is because the way this gets taught is, 35 is the problem, and 36 and 37 is the solution. 36 isn't a solution. It's more complaining. That's why 37 cuts you off of verse 36 with no. Amen. Don't be thinking that way. That's what they did to complain. And if that's what you do, you won't have learned what you needed either. So no. No. You're not going through that like sheep to the slaughter. That's what those things are meant to make you think. Oh, I don't know how I'm going to do it. That curriculum is not going to make you look like a sheep with fear and trembling. Going up. Check is it. it, nice? sure is it, it dead? It off. It, it's still picking up. It's not real good. <clears throat> it's Sorry. almost out. Oh. Yeah, it's out. It's almost okay. dead battery. Okay, well, look, this we'll, we'll cut it off here, I guess. This one up here is still recording. Yeah. Is it? You can hear it. Okay, well, let me just say, okay, well, look, here, here all I, do you understand what I'm saying about this? Because, I'm, I, look, I'm adamant about this. 36 is an issue of the wrong thinking. 36 is not an epiphany that suddenly we realize, oh, we're not, we're not supposed to be doing that. Because when you get to Psalm 44 in verse 22, what are they doing in verse 23? They're continuing the complaint. Yep. That's my point. That's not, well, my point really is, that's not where we are. We are going to look at this as more than conquerors. Now you have to know what that is. We talked about that a little bit in the past, but we're going to enlarge on that when we come back next time.